Average Joe had the idea for a topic, which actually makes a lot of sense, uh, trigger pull. And Joe, so once you, uh, since you had that idea, you give us your thoughts on what you were thinking of there. Well, thanks, Doc. <laughs> Um, the trigger pull thing is, is something that's in my mind because there's a lot of talk on the Internet about it, and we have a lot of talk about this in the gun shop. You know, I'm the only person in the gun shop that is not a competitive shooter, and uh, um, I am at odds with the competitive shooters over what a trigger pull uh, should be. Now, I think there's about five components that go into a trigger pull. The pull weight, uh, you know, how much weight measured in pounds or ounces does it take to uh, manipulate Manipulate that trigger. Uh, number two would be the smoothness of the, of the pull. Uh, number three would be the length of travel or over travel. Uh, the trigger break would be number four, and the trigger reset would be number five. Now, certainly, you know, people can take issue with whether there are more components to the trigger pull or less. Um, but uh, any gun that comes in the shop that does not have a two-pound trigger pull or less. The other people in the shop say, oh, that, that trigger pull is, is uh, too heavy. Um, my feeling on it is that uh, you don't want a pistol that you're carrying for uh, defensive purposes to have that light of a trigger pull. Uh, you're going to be under stress, and I know the competitors say that they are under stress too, but when they're in competition, nobody's life is on the line, and the targets that they're shooting at aren't shooting back at them or, or putting their lives in danger. So um, I like for a trigger pull to be about four to five pounds in semi-auto or seven to eight pounds in uh, uh, a revolver. I'd kind of like to get some revolvers that had a lower trigger pull weight, but um, it just doesn't seem that any of them are coming out in in anything lower than a seven or eight uh, uh, pound pull. Um, one of the things that Masad Ayub cautions folks about, and I think you know, any if, if Masad has found this to be true, you should take note of it, is to be very careful about adjusting the trigger pull on your defensive carry pistols too far below manufacturer specifications because if you wind up in court that's the first thing they're going to look at is what did the manufacturer what did Glock or Colt or whomever um, uh, come out with as the specified trigger pull uh, on that weapon and you got to have a pretty good reason for being able to uh, articulate why you change that um, smoothness of the pull yes you want it to be smooth I have had uh, come across handguns in the past where the trigger pull was fairly light, but it was gritty uh, and just miserable. And then the length of travel and over travel, how far do you have to pull the trigger before it engages and how far back will it continue to uh, go back after you've pulled it? Um, we tend to want a fairly short length of travel and short um, uh, length of over travel as well, uh, and similar with the reset. We like light resets, but one of the things, short resets, but one of the things that I've come across in the past is you can take that to um, a point where it becomes detrimental to me. If I get a pistol, and I've had both single action and double action pistols this way, where they've got maybe a three pound trigger pull and the reset is very short, um, I can wind up with a negligent discharge there because during recoil and coming back down, because of the light trigger pull and because of the very short reset, um, it goes off before I'm ready to. And yes, my finger is touching it, um, but because of that, I avoid um, handguns with a less than a four-pound uh, trigger pull. And uh, the last component would be the trigger break, and I hear a lot of people talk about this, and usually what I hear them say is it should break, and, and by trigger break we mean how does it feel when the trigger finally uh, um, you know, breaks on the, on the sear and makes the uh, hammer or striker go forward, 
and I hear a lot of people talking about, well, it should be smooth as breaking a glass rod. The only problem is I haven't broken too many glass rods in my life, so I don't know if that's a good estimation or not. Um, I recall breaking one in high school chemistry class, but that was an inadvertent dropping. It wasn't uh, uh, me snapping. So I've kind of thrown out my preferences. So let's hear from everybody else. That's a, that's a pretty good uh, summary that you gave there, Randy, of a lot of the qualities of the trigger. Um, Thank you, I, Paul. I, I come from a background of competitive shooting myself, and so there was a time where I just really believed that all of those qualities just had to be absolutely perfect for a gun to be a quote good gun, a, a good quality trigger. And, and I'm, I guess I'm, I'm glad I've, I've progressed beyond that belief. Um, I have guns in the safe that have unbelievable break, break like a glass rod type pound and three quarter triggers on them. And I have guns that have six, seven, eight pound triggers. And until we start getting to a, you know, 25 yard shot on an eight inch target, um, it just really doesn't matter to me anymore. Uh, a trigger press, as long as we're in the reasonable range, is going to be just fine for especially defensive use. And that's, that's kind of how you define this. You said you look at it from a defensive standpoint. Um, the things that matter most to me from a defensive standpoint for a trigger is for the trigger to be relatively short. I don't mind a trigger in the six, seven, eight pound range as long as the trigger travel from the front of the trigger back to the brake isn't too terribly long. Um, what I find with myself and I find with students over and over and over again is pressing the trigger and getting the hits really is an, an act of concentration. We have to make sure that our sights are properly aligned. We have to make sure that those sights are properly placed on the target while we maintain that alignment. And then we have to press that trigger smoothly to the rear without disturbing the sights from their alignment or their position on the target. That's a heck of a lot of things to do all at once when you need to make a shot that requires sighted fire. Yeah. So to have to maintain that over, you know, a, a long travel and a heavy weight, like a double action revolver or a double action handgun can be very challenging and it is something difficult to, to master. That being said, you throw a Glock, even with a, a, a New York trigger, um, it's fairly short. It's relatively light in comparison, and it's not anywhere near as difficult uh, to, to accomplish that goal as it is with a double-action gun. And so that's what it really is about to me, is having a relatively short trigger press. And it's nice to have that clean break where all of a sudden the trigger just lets off and goes. And then I also like to have a fairly firm reset, a, a, a trigger that's going to press the finger back out um, yeah. to the front, that that helps me shoot faster. End of story. Um, it, it gives me a better gauge and makes sure, and this is really the key to that, it makes sure or helps to ensure that I don't short stroke that trigger. I don't start the next trigger press before the trigger has fully reset, and that's really the key with that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of my favorite trigger setups right now is uh, a, a New York trigger in a Glock with a minus connector in it. And that gives you about the same six-pound trigger press that you find in a stock Glock, but it gives it a much firmer reset, a drive back to the front because of that heavier spring. Um, and, and again, here I am shooting a, a six-and-a-half, six-pound trigger um, almost as well as I shoot that pound and three-quarter trigger on my, my old competition gun, which I should probably put up for sale. <laughs> now, just to clear up, though, when you talk about New York trigger, mm -hmm. are you talking about the New York State trigger or the New York City trigger? Uh, there, there are actually two different ones. I'm talking specifically about the New York one. Does that make sense, Joe? The New York one trigger. Well, from I've Glock? heard them. I've heard them refute, referred to as the New York State police trigger, which is seven to eight pounds, and then the New York City trigger, which is twelve pounds. Yeah, they probably have really good hot dogs and pizza in New York City, but that's, you know, <laughs> now we're now we're driving towards that double action weight again. So, yeah. um the the connector that I use and and what I would really prefer and and I've got some of these are the old black New York 1 triggers. Uh trigger return springs. Um those are nice. Those black 
New York ones with that minus connector, that's what I really like. So New York one, um, the the new green ones are okay too, but the black are better. Okay. And so I don't know the difference between the state or the city, honestly. As point of clarification, um, there are better hot dogs and pizza in Chicago than in New York. <laughs> oh, I, I will agree with that. And, uh, you know, even better gun laws these days. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's surprising. Who ever thought that? Right, exactly. <laughs> you know, and I, and I, I guess um, to clear this up for somebody that is not 100% familiar with what we're talking about, you don't want your trigger pull. I don't want my trigger pull to be so light that I wind up with negligent discharges, and I don't want it to be so heavy that to pull the trigger causes me to move the muzzle of the gun off off Absolutely. my point of aim. Basically, you know, I look at it this way: I need the strength of my grip. You know, when I'm when I'm gripping the gun, I would like that to be double the the weight of the trigger or better. So if I'm squeezing with, you know, 10, 12, 20 pounds, well, I want that trigger press to be then less than half of that. That's, that's a ballpark. And I don't, I don't really know how hard I'm squeezing with my hand. Maybe I need to get some kind of a, a squeeze meter or something like that. But, but that, that squeeze has to be significantly greater than the manipulation of the finger. And that helps us to keep that, that gun on target, those sights aligned so that the bullet hits where we want it to hit. Um, and it just it just doesn't take that much. I, I have a, an M and P that Smith and Wesson um, provided to me for some testing and evaluation, and I'm, I'm a little bit flabbergasted about it as to why they would do this. But it's either an attempt at MA compliance or California compliance. But it's got like an eight and three quarter pound trigger, mm. but it's a really good trigger. Mm. Why? Because it's not terribly long, and it has a, a fairly clean break, and it just works. No problem. We can shoot that. Now, we have a lot of people that come in and buy the M&P, and then they come back looking for the uh, Apex mm -hmm. uh, trigger conversion. I've not tried that. Have you? Um, I have one. I mean, it's fabulous. It, it does a great job of taking up the space just to the left of the left-hand monitor on the desk. It's been sitting in a plastic bag for, I don't know, six or nine months. <laughs> I haven't had a chance to put it in, and again, it just it goes to the idea of what we really need to be able to do is manipulate a trigger. When you become decent at manipulating a trigger, a trigger is a trigger is a trigger is a trigger is a trigger. As long as it's not horrifically long and horrifically yeah. you know difficult, a big increase in weight as you press, that's a problem. Really long is a problem. As you mentioned, a lot of, of um, movement in the trigger after the shot breaks, that's not necessarily very good. But other than that, it just doesn't matter. If, if you're all about getting that, that Apex trigger kit, go for it. Do it. Awesome. But I, I don't see it as a necessity anymore. What do you guys think about um, revolvers versus semi-autos for that weight-wise? That, that is how I became better at yeah. shooting a semi-auto is by spending time on the long and, and relatively good double action trigger presses of my revolvers. Yep. If you and want now, to get better at, at yep. semi-auto, yeah, go with the double action revolver. It is it works wonders. It it forces that concentration. Yes. Again, I've got to keep the sights aligned. I've got to keep the sights placed on target, and I've got to press smoothly to the rear while I maintain all three of those things. Right. That's hard to do. Mm -hmm. It really is. And, uh, Doc, I would throw my two cents in on that. Uh, you may remember a couple of years ago I bought three K-frame uh, uh, revolvers. Mm -hmm. And the trigger pulls on those were all about eight pounds, and they were wonderful. Mm -hmm. Whereas I pick up a new Smith & Wesson revolver today, the trigger pull won't even register on my scale because my scale top uh, stops at 12 pounds. Mm -hmm. And any Smith & Wesson I buy uh, has to go in for a, a trigger job to try to get it, you know, below the, the 12 pound mark. Mm -hmm. I do recall. 
Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna find a varying degree of that, and that's true. Some of the the newer stuff, you know, uh, especially they're putting out commodity, not commodity, but you know what I mean, bigger sellers. If they want to get it out faster, they don't pay as much as a, uh, of attention to, I guess, honing it up to a certain degree. Yeah. But, uh, uh, I I find the triggers on out of the box Rugers to be much better than out of the box Smith and Wessons. And in fact, the LCR line, um, Ruger put some time into patenting a new cam to make it as with as less amount of friction uh, as possible. Mm -hmm. And you know, but in the past, would you say it was reversed that the Rugers were not as good as the Smiths to begin? I mean, you know, ages ago. You know, I, I, I'm not really equipped to answer that because. Mm -hmm. As you know, I just bought uh, a couple of SP-101s last year, yeah, yeah. and that was really the first time I had experienced a Ruger double-action trigger. I, I've had single-action Rugers in the past. Mm -hmm. Well, what you know, somebody wants to go out and, and say, well, yeah, okay, I take all of your information to heart. I want uh, a gun that does this. They don't have scales to measure each trigger, uh, what can they do? Uh, I mean, there's information, you know, where you can go out and read, basically. Yeah. Uh, like what Joe's done here, uh, you know, where he has measured that and, and published it. Any other thoughts? Uh, well, try before you buy, if, if you can. Uh, go to a range if, if there's a couple of pistols or, or revolvers um, or revolvers and pistols that you're thinking about buying. If you can get into a range that rents, uh, you know, most of those, see what works well for you. Mm -hmm. Good point. If, if, um, <clears throat> if I could interject about the triggers for women, yeah. um, and I, I loved all of the things that you said, great in considerations for, for triggers. One of the things that for me in particular, because I have very, very short fingers, is trigger reach. Yes. Um, yes. When it comes to double stack firearms, 90% of sub, double, ax, double stack firearms are too big for me. And I just have to learn how to get around that and make do. Um, but your revolvers, many of them, I just can't reach the, the, the trigger. Mm -hmm. And that combined with them being very heavy makes it uh, extremely difficult for me to yeah. fire a revolver well, especially if we're talking about doing more than three cylinders worth of, uh, unless the trigger has been worked quite a bit to make yeah. it lighter and smoother. So um, when it comes to those kinds of things for considering for people with small hands, a lot of times we hear the things like, oh, well, all the women should have revolvers. Um, that might not be a great consideration for someone with really short, small hands. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and that does, like uh, Grant brings up uh, a lot that, uh, like Smith & Wesson versus, say, the Ruger in the, what they call the medium large frames, like the 686 and the GP100. Uh, Ruger has a much uh, smaller or shorter trigger reach than the Smith & Wesson does. Uh, and for that reason, you know, the Ruger may be the better. And they do pretty much, and uh, Joe, you... You probably can corroborate this, I guess, but don't you feel that that's the case? I mean, even with the the smaller J frames and the SP one hundred and one. Yeah, the SP one hundred and one is just a really phenomenal uh, um, revolver, and you know, with all revolvers, there might be things you could do, Melanie, like change the grips. Um, to find a slimmer or yeah, yeah. A, a smaller grip that would allow you to make that trigger reach, and and with your double stack pistols, if you're if you're talking about a polymer pistol, and there's a double stack, like you know you've got a Glock 19 and you'd like to be able to carry it, but you're just having a problem with the reach. Um, I'll give a plug to Hawkeye Ordnance in Iowa. Um, I two of my Glocks are down there right now. Um, having uh, the grips reduced and stippled, and they do a phenomenal job of undercutting the trigger guard. And I'll I'll write about these when I uh, when I get them back. But um, and along with that, I would say if you're going to do 
uh, grip reduction, have it done by a professional that's done it. Um, because I've seen a lot of photos of people who they do it and it wasn't quite enough. And so they go back and they remove some more of the material, still wasn't quite enough. They went back and removed more and, and now they felt it was really good. And then they thought, well, maybe I'll just remove just a little bit more and maybe it will make it even better. Mm -hmm. And now suddenly they've got a, a pistol where the structural integrity of the frame is uh, affected. So I would always recommend having a professional do that. Yeah, my I have a Glock 19 that has had an aggressive grip reduction from um, Bowie Tactical uh -huh. down there in, in Ohio. And um, he has pretty much reduced it as much as it possibly can without um, degrading the structural integrity. And it helped tremendously. Um, so yes, for, for people like small hands like mine, um, our grip reduction is, is certainly the way to go. Um, I wish my trigger was set back just I'm talking, you know, an eighth of an inch would make a huge world of difference. I still can't shoot it as well as I shoot a um, a single yeah. stack, but it, it does absolutely make a world of difference. And I agree, get it done by someone who <laughs> is qualified to do it. And I think now we're getting into the territory where something like an Apex uh, makes a difference because there are some of the Apex kits that modify the trigger reach and so that could be really beneficial good point. yeah and i have an apex in my shield i um the first shield i ever shot did not have an apex trigger in it and um when i bought mine i opted to have the apex put into it because it does take out some of that grittiness that you were talking about and also smooth it down a little bit um, i like that it has that really distinct break and that very distinct reset so there's no guesswork involved of did i did i short stroke it um am i to the break yet is it gonna you know so i've really enjoyed the apex like you kind of said paul it's not necessarily necessary i mean if you can run a trigger you can run a trigger um but it does give you a little bit better feedback all good points very good. Anybody want to add anything else to it? Uh, that was a good uh, good idea there. Uh, I, Joe, I was going to say I'd take credit for it and then get, let him talk about it, but uh, that was a good that was a good uh, good topic for tonight. I think. Oh, there was one some uh, one other thing I wanted to bring up. Yes, Doc. please. Um, I just recently had two articles published in Gun Digest magazine. Uh, on the CZ ProTech 1 and the Walther CCP. And they had to do some editing uh, from what I originally submitted, which is fine. Um, that's what editors do is edit and say, you know, you never know when you submit an article um, how much space they've got. They may have to make edits to condense your article a little bit. But one of the edits they made in talking about the CCP, um, I was talking about how easy the slide is to rack. And I mentioned that people who have arthritis or some other type of a hand injury um, will find this slide much to their liking. And they changed that to say um, small statured people and females may find this slide to their liking. Mm. And I just want the listenership to know I didn't make that sexist statement uh, about women not being able to work a slide because I know many, many women, I see them in the shop all day long, um, that can work slides just fine. So that didn't come from average Joe. Well said, because you know you're going to be getting some hate mail. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's how I knew uh, um, uh, Melody hadn't read it. <laughs> yeah, I see across the internet there. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, so when we read it, we'll know, hey, those aren't Joe's words. Not average Joe approved. No. <laughs> very good. Very good. All right. Well, it was a good, uh, good show tonight. Um, uh,